there's a strange little verse in Proverbs 30 in verse 15. And it, in the King James, it speaks about the horse leech. It's just a terrible thing that flourishes in the pools where the horses come to drink, fastens on their tongue and lips. It's a terrible thing. And uses this term, the leech or the horse leech has two daughters, give and give, or the Hebrew might have give and take. Give it to me or I'll take it from you. The twin sisters of avarice and selfish ambition. And the Bible goes on to speak about the things that never say enough. The grave never says that's enough. The barren womb, uh, the earth that drinks in the water and the fire that consumes everything. They never say enough. And we're surrounded by an environment in the West, where people never have enough. They never say that's enough. They're never content. And in the New Testament, we have these two very important verses in Paul's letter to Timothy, first letter to Timothy, where he writes, a godliness with contentment is great gain. And then he says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. It's like a game of Monopoly. Play as passionately as you will. At the end of the game, it all goes back in the box. You don't take anything with you except what you can send on ahead by serving the Lord, by putting it into the Lord's work. And he takes the riches of time and turns them into eternal riches if we entrust them to him. And I think of the story of Job on that horrible day when he lost everything that was dear to him except his faith in the Lord. He tore his robe, he shaved his head, he fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Quite some years ago now, I was preaching in Oakville, Ontario, in Canada. And sometimes when you're preaching, all of a sudden an idea sort of comes into your head and you feel it's from the Lord and you utilize it. I was preaching the gospel and um, just sort of on the fly, I said, you know, when you come into this world, you get a little bed in the hospital room, you get a little sheet that doesn't quite cover you, and you get a little plastic bracelet. And then if things go well, your parents take you home. They give you a bedroom. And uh, eventually you grow up and maybe you go off to college or you move away and you get a little apartment of your own. And then maybe you find someone that you fall in love with and you decide to spend your life with them and you find a little starter home. And you fix it up and it's great and it's fun and everything, you know, the early matrimonial furniture style, whatever you can find, you try to fix it up and then um, you know, God blesses you, you make some money, and you think, well, we could have a little nicer home, a few children on the way. You look around, you find a nice middle-class home, you move into it, and and then uh, something about, you know, if you just had a nicer home in a nicer neighborhood, and so you start looking around, and you move up, and get a bigger mortgage, and get a bigger house, and a bigger yard, and more things to look after, and then eventually the kids grow up and they go away and you think to yourself, what are we doing with this big house? We really ought to downsize. And so you put it on the market and uh, you get a nice condo or maybe a little gated community somewhere. And then, you know, as time goes by, you know, the, the body starts to fall apart and you need lots of support. And you say, we're going to move into a retirement village and maybe into a retirement home and then you end up with a room with a few pieces of vestiges of your once fashionable home with all its furniture. And yeah, eventually you end up in the hospital with a little sheet that doesn't quite cover you and a little plastic bracelet. And then Solomon says the last move is to what he calls the long house, the coffin. It's over. Look, does that sound bleak? The fact of the matter is that's it. We go the way of all flesh. It happens. And the question is, do we have a plan B? Is there something other than this world? Everybody around us 
you know, whoever dies with the most toys wins. That can't be. Well, what I didn't know was that morning in the audience was a gentleman who had been invited along by a man in that local fellowship who supervised the building of massive homes along the lakeshore. This man had the biggest home in Oakville, and that's saying something. These homes would have big underground parking lots for all their cars. You name it, they had it. And he had just had this massive home built. And there he was sitting in the audience. As he came out the door, he said to me, my wife will never give up that home. She's not going to downsize. Yeah, right. I said, you know, when I was just a young preacher, my wife and I and a little boy, we were driving down the California coast from San Francisco to LA, and we came on the Hearst Castle, and we went in to have a look around. William Randolph Hearst built this magnificent home along the shore, looking across the Pacific Ocean. He actually had whole rooms of castles in Europe dismantled, each stone numbered, and brought over and reassembled on that mountainside. You name it, he had it. He had his own zoo with exotic animals, had to ship in chunks of ice for the polar bears. You name it, it was there. As we came to the end of the tour with a little group of people, the guide said, well, did you see anything that was missing here? And everybody was like, no, no, no. And I said, well, yeah, one thing. She said, what? I said, William Randolph first. <sighs> Look, either it leaves you or you leave it. It doesn't make sense to invest in the things of this world. And so, Timothy, says the Apostle Paul, not only should you be content having food and clothing, but discover the truth that godliness with contentment is great gain. Don't let those horse leeches fasten on to you. Everywhere you look, it's give and take. Give it to me or I'll take it from you. That's the spirit of our world. But God has called us beyond that to understand the tremendous spiritual riches we have that we can afford to be generous with our material goods, with our time, with our, with our hearts, because he has invested so much in us. It's not that we're to be content in the spiritual realm. We should not be satisfied until we are like Christ. But in the material realm, it makes no sense to accumulate all this pre-dust, all this stuff that's just going to turn to ash, and put our hearts in it. Let's put our hearts beyond this, where our treasure is, our spiritual wealth. May God help us to lay claim to these glorious truths and be content with what we have. And even when we lose, like Job, to get down and worship, because nothing substantial can ever be taken away from the child of God. Our wealth is beyond thieves, beyond robbers, beyond the corrosive influences, beyond the devaluation of this world. May God help us to lay hold of the true riches and to live like wealthy people, affording to be generous with others, because God has been so generous with us. <laughs>